Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to DIA Talks Online. My name is Matilde Guidalli. I am DIA's Associate Curator, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all today for a conversation between artist, writer, and filmmaker Jill Maggie and Nicholas Box Weber, writer and longtime executive director of the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation. Uh, the occasion for today's conversation is Jill's beautiful exhibition currently on view at Dia Bridgehampton, featuring the series Homage CMYK, uh, 11 four channel silk screens on linen that take as departure points two unlicensed works by Joseph Albers as the departure for a prismatic investigation of authorship. Um, but before diving into the conversation, um, today's event is co presented with the Albers Foundation, and we wish to we wish to thank everyone at the Albers Foundation and the uh, who helped making this event possible. Uh, with special thanks to Max Tannon, Theodora Lang, Andrea Villa, and Maria Vogel, and Josh Slocum, who's here with us. Um, and a bit of housekeeping too. You'll see the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we be invited to drop questions as we go. And a reminder that this program is closed captioned and you can activate the function by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screens. Um, so now I will ask all panelists to turn on their cameras so we can see you. So welcome all and thank you again for um, this conversation that I think I will start by sharing the screen and so that we can see a few images of Jill's show in Bridgehampton. And, and then I'll let, give it up on to you to continue the conversation. So feel free to jump in anytime. Here are a few installation views of the exhibition that is on view through June 6 at the Bridgehampton in Bridgehampton on Long Island. Here are a few views of the silk screens that Jill will tell us how she made. Mm -hmm. And here's a detail uh, so you can appreciate the um, texture of each of the prints. Jill and Mathilde. Yes. Well, I have permission even before an actual discussion has begun to give a quick reaction. As I look at these images, uh, I've been working with Joseph Albers's art for 50 years, and I am just fascinated by what I'm seeing because it's as if um, you, Jill, understand the experience of looking at art in a way that is so dependent on light. And I don't know if that's a primary intention for you, but I'm having the reaction, oh, someone understands what happens when a painting is too near to daylight coming in mm -hmm. through a window in a certain way, or when it's become very dark outside and paintings change so much according to light, and you've evoked something of that. So I'm giving an untutored but very personal reaction um, as someone who, as I say, I've, I've spent half a century carrying these works, installing them, and so on. And you, you have shown them in, in a, for me, a very brilliant way. Thanks, Nick. That's so um, meaningful for me to hear. Because um, I have to admit, and you can ask Matilda, I was nervous what you would, <laughs> what you would think about the work having um, been so close with Albers's work um, for so long. So it was um, very meaningful for me to to hear your reactions to the work. And um, I mean, I, I have a lot of thoughts about that idea of light and being conscious of light. 
I think um, something I'm really interested in is, I guess you could call the agency of the artwork. Um, so the life the artwork has once it leaves the artist's studio, which I guess in this situation, you could say beyond the curator's hands as well, right? Um, so because these, these fake Albers or <laughs> similar paintings to Albers that were in Barragon's house, um, since they were in a domestic setting, um, especially in a house uh, like Barragon's that was designed around the light specifically, you know, so the yellow one or orange one that you're seeing here, um, because for anyone who doesn't know, um, all of the yellow orange paintings that you're seeing in my exhibition um, are the same painting. Um, so just to explain that, that there were two unlicensed photographs in Casa Barragon, one yellow orange, one blue, and the yellow one is in the dining room um, next to Barragon's famous cross window. And so you are seeing, not in this one particularly, because the light is... Um, not capturing it so well, but on the three in a row, you see this crossbar. And what you're seeing is the bar of the window and the garden light coming in through the trees that Barragon designed, um, his garden he designed, um, reflecting onto the surface of the painting on linen. Um, and actually in the middle painting, what you're seeing is the reflection itself. So the photograph was taken through the glass from outside. And um, like Nick, what you're saying um, was the thing that really amazed me about how these um, Albers paintings became, and I say Albers paintings, even though they're kind of not, but they are, um, how they kind of become registrations of the light at the moment the photograph was taken. So you're getting so many experiences of light. Um, you're getting the room at the time of day, the angle in which it was photographed. Um, and then of course, all these other processes of reproduction that I wouldn't say necessarily have to do with light. Um, but I just couldn't believe how vastly um, this one image would change depending on the factors of light in the, in the time of photography. And especially because Albers was always talking about how um, light could be, uh, color was deceptive depending on its relation to another color or its lighting condition. It just seemed almost like, like poignant, but also even humorous like how, how much paintings were affected. It was like his theories were kind of expanded even further beyond the frame. Well, I love it when you refer to the agency of the artwork because your art for me, um, rather than being something that recapitulates a Joseph Albers point or mm. sort of following Albers, it's something totally different and, and absolutely wonderful in that respect because you have animated the paintings. You've made the paintings in a certain way into living beings that once they're out of the artist's hands, um, they then have a further life. They have a, a life in many different ways. They have a life as commercial objects. They have a life as objects to be reproduced. Uh, and it's, it's quite an interesting thing that you've done. I mean, Annie Albers, who worked closely with Paul Clay, starting when she was 22 years old, told me that Clay said that the value of an artwork is that it's not that you are looking at the artwork, the artwork is looking at you. 
Now, you've created a very, very rich exchange where that artwork has become something new and something with, um, with, a, with a further life and, and with that quality of agency that you mentioned. I have one question that I should have asked in a previous conversation with you or could have researched. What size are these paintings? Um, oh my God, can you believe I'm like forgetting the exact size? Matilde, what is the exact size? I, I used to be able to tell you this in millimeters and inches and feet. Yes. And now I'm forgetting. We had a technical mishap before we all began and I'm still coming down from the stress. <laughs> I think uh, the most important thing to say, Jill, is that you the, the, chose the, the size yeah. according to the size of the pretend albers that Barragan yes. had in his own okay. house. That's a so. much better response. <laughs> yes. So, um, so it was really important to me um, that through all the transformations that the original fake albers um, went through, that it that it the works that I made went full circle. So um, the yellow and the blue um, albers in Casa Baragon are both exactly the same size. Um, and apparently from something I read that you wrote, Nick, um, Baragon bought them um, for a dollar in a strip mall um, in the United States somewhere. It was in a book that you edited. And, um, um, and then frame them. And um, so both of them are the same size. And so when I um, had them go through all the transformation they did in order to get where they are now hanging at Dia, um, they returned to silk screen on linen and yeah. the original size. And even the frame color is the same. So the yellow series, um, which is the living room series, has a white frame and the um, library has a black frame. And that again, refers back to the decisions um, that Baragon made in Casa Baragon. So I'm, I'm kind of a fan of defaults. Um, like every decision I make in a work, there's, it's not arbitrary. There's really a reason. And so I like, I like going back to a default, like Albers or whoever faked these Albers gave me conditions. And yeah. then I utilized those conditions once again. Well, I, the artist who interests you in this case, Joseph, uh, was a great believer in default. I, I just want to make sure that our listeners today all know a little bit about Albers and Barragan, that they knew each other, uh, had great admiration for each other. And Joseph Albers, Joseph and Annie um, in Mexico City went to Barragan's house and were perfectly happy with these reproduction Albers, in part because they didn't purport to be Albers. There's no fake signature. Um, it's not as if anyone sold them as an Albers, which is a whole other thing. And it's a forgery. There's a difference between a forgery and a copy. But when you talk about default and reacting to default, it may have to do with my question about size. Joseph started the homages to the square in 1950 when he was 62 years old. And it was a totally new format for him. Um, although he had worked somewhat in squares in his stained glass work. And he began painting the homages on the smooth side of Masonite. Then he progressed to the rough size. And until the 1960s, the biggest that he ever did was 40 by 40 inches. And then in 1963, he went up to, you say you know things in centimeters and inches, as <laughs> he, and it was 120 centimeters by 120, which was 48 inches by 48 inches, which is 
as big as he got. And I was present in the early 70s when a rather pretentious art critic called on Joseph. And Joseph was much more interested in the practical reasons for things or what you call the default reasons, the reality, you know, those are the frames he used. And the critic was reaching far with his questions and he said to Joseph, Mr. Albers, we noticed that until 1963, you worked in the size of 40 by 40 inches, and then you went up to 48 by 48. And I wondered, was that a response as a European to the scale of the American landscape? <laughs> I looked at him very quizzically. And then the man said, well, if not that, Mr. Albers, you know, we're, we're now at the moment of trying to reach outer space and with satellite program and so on, does it have to do with that reaching for a vaster space? And again, Joseph was just so puzzled. And then the fellow said, <laughs> well, Mr. Albers, was this your reaction to abstract expressionism? Uh, by the way, not Joseph's particular thing. Was this a reaction to the great scale of the painters of the 1950s and the, the very large canvases and, and you were trying to, to match them. And Joseph looked at him and said, young man, 1963 was the year we got a bigger station wagon. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, decisions <laughs> sometimes just come from, you know, the default setting. I mean, what, what can you do? Yeah. And, and I'm thankful that, that um, Joseph made those decisions for me. And well, actually he did and he didn't because the size is bigger than, than that in these because they were copies. But one thing I think um, is really interesting without going too much into forgery copy and all of those, because I think where you're taking this conversation, I find more specific and more interesting, but one thing when I was researching these um, two paintings in Casa Baragon was there was a moment, I forgot which year I have it saved, but um, one of the paintings, uh, the yellow one was, I think the yellow one was borrowed by the Museum of Modern Art in Mexico. And um, the paperwork called it an Albers. It didn't say it was a copy of Albers. It says it was an Albers and it was installed in the museum as an Albers. Wow. Um, it was part of a show that was about Barragon. So that was what was so interesting. It was focused on Barragon, but that painting where it was in relationship to the window in Barragon's house became so much you could almost say it was, it's the default image of Casa Baragon. It's the most used one is this image that in so many, yeah. And so many photographers have taken it from slightly different angles, but it's the cross window and you have the Albers at an angle there. And so it's interesting how the painting one of its roles as its own agent has become as like a pointer back to this architecture that you almost like by using and incorporating the painting, it's a way to describe Barragon, which I don't, I just find that like really kind of amazing. What I also find remarkable is that both men were devout Catholics. And looking at this photograph, one certainly sees the cross in the religious sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and Joseph certainly did. I mean, he was practicing again at the end of his life. He had been brought up um, religiously and then didn't practice for many years. But when cruciform images appear in his work, and when we have a sense of, even if you will, um, certain qualities that are associated with religion, the way that light passes through glass being mm -hmm. comparable to the Immaculate Conception, mm -hmm. 
these ideas were very important to him. And looking at that photograph, you do feel as if there's almost some sort of religious occurrence taking place. I mean, the perspective of the photograph adds to that. The first time I saw photographs of Barragan's house, I assumed he had paintings by Albers. Mm -hmm. and there is a lot of afterlife to an artwork, as, mm -hmm. as you say. But I'm wondering, it's a question I asked you the last time we spoke. There are people who have said of your work that it's a sort of a political statement on marketability and art as a commercial object and even on the whole issue of forgeries. And I'm wondering if you see it that way. I mean, it's a great question, and I don't, I don't know if I have an overarching answer for every single project, but I think, I mean, you could start saying the thing of like, every decision is political, and there's, of course, a truth to that. But I would say what drives me more is in thinking about, like, let's go back to the agency of the artwork, right? Um, how much do you trust the artwork? You know, how much do you trust the artist and the artwork to, to carry its own weight, right? And so I think what's interesting with like my, my um, explorations of authorship, I love how the Diatex called it a prismatic investigation of authorship because you bring back this idea of light and angles and in which light are you seeing something. And I think that is more um, what interests me and there's political and legal and social ramifications to all those things and I'm totally interested in them. But I think it's because I believe in a work and especially a work that's as canonized as homage to the square. I think there's a lot of room to explore what is happening to these artworks once they're out in the world and once they're like allowed to have a less controlled life, you know, like, and this whole thing of reproduction, like what's really, really interests me with Albers is his work as a whole, you know, and, and not just in the homages, like if you're looking throughout his whole career, there's this like unrelenting commitment to try to understand certain things like the relationship of color. And then he finds this form, the homage to the square, and it becomes so recognizable that someone in a mall can print two squares on top of a bigger square and you're already in the world of Albers. I mean, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, that's just a few squares and it goes back to that. So I think, um, I think where the control and copyright and all of that can get in the way is when it doesn't allow a work to have this afterlife that it, can have and to trust it to have that. So um, I think if you're only looking at the political um, ramifications of that, you're, you're looking at people's relationship to that work, like property, because a thing is a thing and then property is people's relationship to that thing. So I'm really interested in this work of looking at like, what is the thing, you know? And what is the thing when it's moved around? Um, I don't know if that answered it so it's, well. As, as always with you, you're so interesting and provocative that not only did it answer it, but it sort of takes one's mind into a couple of very, very, related directions and things that I I want to tell you about Joseph. I mean, for one thing, let's just go back for a moment to the quality of light and everything that you approach with the afterlife of an artwork is dependent on light. 
Um, and if you're thinking of an artwork as a commodity, I mean, they tend to be lit to smithereens in the auction houses. I mm. mean, quite disgraceful. They're um, generally, you know, under much too bright a light and they flourish in natural light. But the way that Joseph painted every square was under very controlled light conditions. Um, he worked on work tables, which were simply four by eight pieces of plywood on sawhorses. And one of those work tables was underneath an arrangement of fluorescent bulbs that was warm, cold, cold, warm. And over the other table, he had warm, cold, warm, cold. And he looked at every painting under both sets of light conditions in order to get the qualities that he wanted and to get the same light intensity in different colors. He said that even Turner, and this was Joseph speaking, he had great admiration for Turner. He said that even Turner struggled with this issue of light intensity. Um, and, and then when you talked about the the afterlife and the meaning of reproduction and all, all of which your work raises to me in a particularly successful way. Um, I go back to the idea that you don't repeat or expand on Albers, you do something totally different and something very, very rich in its own way. But in, I spend a lot of time um, in court dealing with fake Albers, um, or at the moment missing court because uh, one, one can't go into the courthouse in Milan where we've got a trial going on as we speak. Um, but people have thought about them as commercial commodities. And the minute there's money involved, uh, you get real fakes. And one of the things that's so refreshing about your work is that it doesn't have to do with money and faking in that respect or, or the commercial elements. But I was once at Christie's in London, uh, having been called in to authenticate or not authenticate a painting, and I saw a red homage to the square pretty good size. And at the time, it would have been worth what we would call a lot of money on the marketplace, except that it wasn't real. And I looked at it and said to the saleswoman, I'm terribly sorry to tell you, but that will not be in our catalog resume, which is a polite way of saying um, it's a forgery. And she looked at me and she looked right at the painting and she said, oh, it was such a beautiful painting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there you have it. Yep. The, <laughs> no, it's, it's, really, um, it's really interesting, like depending on what, what lens you're looking at looking through rather, right? That, that in that context, when it's about value and monetary value of what it's worth, because we all know in the art world, you don't know what something is worth in money until it comes up for sale, right? That's when it, it's constantly determined. And it's not, I have no problem with um, the works being for sale and then circulating um, I think it's great. They should have a life and they should be um, for, for sale, but it also depends, and mine are, I'm not saying I have anything against that. Um, but I think it is interesting, like with that statement, it's, it's very complicated because it's about money in that context because it's being auctioned. But it's also, um, there's always this tie, I think, between the maker and the object, right? So the, the notion when you're like up close to an Albers and you can feel or imagine his palette knife going onto the masonite, 
the idea that it's someone else doing that action and it wasn't him, there's a genuineness taken out of that because you're thinking of, um, um, <laughs> you're thinking of, um, yeah, the object as part of a process. And especially there's something with Albers, like in 2014, I did a show called Homage that I repainted or not repainted, but I painted a series of Albers um, works that had been shown in Casa Baragon. And I visited um, the Joseph and Annie Albers estate in Connecticut. And um, Joseph writes on the back of his paintings, exactly, exactly which paints he uses, what glazes, everything that he's doing. Um, and so I, I copied the, the recipes, let's say, off the back of the paintings. And I made it a point to um, find every tube of paint that he mentions on the back, because he wouldn't just say the color, he would say the brand of paint. And um, that became months long um, chase to find these paintings, uh, these paint tubes and this table that you see here has all of my note pages from my book where I was, I'd written down the recipes, I call them that Joseph put on the back and then my searches to locate that tube of paint so I could try to paint that painting. And what I realized is these notes in my sketchbook was the same thing that Joseph was doing on the back of his paintings that instead I was doing it in my sketchbook. So I realized that and made this table with all the notes. But unlike the forgeries, I was never trying to like fake an Albers. I was trying to feel what Albers felt when he was making them. I was trying to get closer to that process to like get involved with the relationship of Baragon and Albers by trying to get closer to the materiality of the work, knowing that it would fail, you know, but I was like really curious, what would this failure look like? You know, I'm going to try as hard as I can to follow all of the masonite, the size, the paint tubes. And what was amazing is um, that even when I found all the colors that Joseph had written, the, the, I learned from the paint companies that every few years they change the recipe of the paint or they discontinue one color and it morphs into another color. So Joseph's yellow paintings became beige and browns and oranges and pinks. And um, I found myself constantly going back to original Albers because I had this hard time um, getting the palette knife exactly straight along the bottom. So I was like, oh, mine are messy. And then I'd go to see Joseph's and I was like, his are kind of messy too. Like he doesn't have, it's not like machined. You feel the hand. And so I felt myself like wanting to, um, to say to people, you know, Joseph's are messy too. <laughs> like, like wanting to almost defend my action, but it was, um, it was a very joyful time in my studio painting these. And partially it was because the constraints that Albers had already set up in his work and that each one became this mystery because I didn't know how mine was going to look in relationship to his. But it was also an exercise in color theory because the two works that you see now are the same work. So there was a catalog printed um, of the show of these paintings by Albers in Casa Baragon in, in Baragon studio. And the catalog, the printing of the colors was so incongruous <laughs> with the actual paintings Albert did that it made like a whole nother exhibition <laughs> of like misrepresented Albers. So there was this like, this kind of never ending 
false reproduction that was happening every time you were trying to present the painting to an audience, not in the original face-to-face -face form, you in a way spawned another quasi Albers. Well, so I thought that was amazing. I, I find this just fascinating. And when you talk about this quality of messiness, when he was asked how he applied paint, he said, the way I spread butter on bread. Yeah. And it's very much like that. And then he would go on about the subject of bread because he really missed black Westphalian bread and thought that American bread was, quote, like Kleenex. <laughs> uh, that's how texture conscious he was. Uh, but of course, everything is hand done and we see the human hand very clearly. What you say about colors changing in according to the batch at the very end of his, near to the end of his life, the beginning of, it was January of 1976 that I walked into that very simple bare bones house one day and how are you, Mr. Albers? Ah, not so good today, Nick, schlecht. And I asked him what the problem was and he said, he was trying to do a painting and he really wanted to get the colors to be the same light intensity. It was three square square. And he said that he wanted to do it, you know, there are four formats and he wanted to do it in the format where the middle square is large. And Joseph said to me, you know, the problem is when I do a study for it with the current Winsor Newton cobalt green, number 205, it just isn't working. Downstairs, and he pointed below the middle square is fine, but upstairs is hell, which <laughs> meant that there was no, he just wasn't getting the interaction and he wasn't getting the right relationship of the colors. And he said, but when I do the study, with the old Windsor Newton, number 196, the old cobalt green, I get just the relationship that I'm looking for. And he said that uh, he, he saw the middle square as the cosmos and the cosmos should not have edges or sharp corners. And he wanted the right cobalt green to achieve that. Well, Jill, I called every art supply store in Connecticut, to see if anyone had 196s left. No one did. I ended up calling Windsor Newton's American corporate headquarters, got the director on the phone, and he just said, there's no difference in our batches of cobalt green. And I said, sir, I'm calling for Joseph Albers. And said, Joseph Albers, yes. Two days later, a box arrived at Birchwood Drive, six tubes of cobalt green number 196. Uh, and Joseph was able to do the painting the way that he wanted. And he said to me, Cartier-Bresson told me I did circular squares. And that meant that the corners did evaporate. And I have to do it that way with the cosmos big in the middle, because I feel the cosmos is getting much nearer. And it was the last painting he ever did. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. He had such a beautiful sense of what paint could do and, and what color meant. Yeah, and I think um, this is such a side thing, but I, I think it's really, um, there's it, what you're saying, it makes me think of a conversation about technology. Because a lot of times with my work, people say, oh, I'm so related to technology. And, um, and I, I always find it funny, uh, but painting is also a technology. Like we just now think of everything digital as a technology. And I think that 
um, what's so incredible is when you called the head of Windsor, you said Windsor Newton, right? <laughs> yeah, when you called and he was saying, no, you know, there's no difference. Right. But then when it's Albers who like knows the consistency of paint, like everyone knows that, you know, he he's this expert on the viscosity or the, you know, how much oil to pigment and all of that, that then it's like, oh, you must be right. You know, and I bet you it made him more aware from then on of how batches of paint change. You know, yeah. it, it probably changed the way they thought of the making of paint after that. When and it, oh, you, you see into the future. I quite love it. No, but I, I mean, I think it like it really happens that way that that um, I think that's one thing that artists are like underused for, you know, is that um, the especially because he was so economical um, with, you know, the squares as a way to try to put color next to color and see, and it seems so simple, but I remember when I was painting these seven and there were more on the wall, I kept getting so confused between like, wait, am I working on the one? Cause they're all numbered and stuff. And so I was like, wait, is this for the big square or the square? And I'd get them all um, confused. And I had, if you looked at the notes on the paper, it was very, like it had to go down to a real science. Um, because the other thing with the masonite is you could not paint over a color. I don't know if he did that, but whenever I tried to fix something or paint over, I had to throw the whole thing out. He never painted over a color. He, um, and the whole thing, the whole big difference for him with prints um, was that in the homage to the square prints, there's ink on top of ink on top of ink. Mm. But in the paintings, um, he got perfect registration between the different colors, but each paint is on top of a very carefully prepared white ground. Yeah. And I even followed those directions. So the finding white. the right masonite, I mean, that was a whole, it was such a wild goose chase to, to come after that you start appreciating the smooth versus the bumpy. And then there's some bumpy that's almost like hairy the masonite and it's really hard to paint on so you can't get that kind um so so yeah it was um it just made me appreciate his work on this whole other level but it wasn't just the materials it was also you know it is a kind of religious experience to um to paint these and also to know you're stepping into this triangle or creating a triangulation of authorship, you know, between Baragon and Albers and, um, and the works. And because I was, uh, this was kind of that first part in 2014 was, a, was a, a kind of tangent off my work on Baragon whose um, work right now is not really allowed to have this afterlife. It's very, very, very controlled. Um, and the relationship between Baragon and Albers presented itself as this like sincere relationship through the work. I mean, they were friends, but like they didn't hang out a lot and talk together a lot. It was more through their work that they appreciated one another. And so it was there that I tried to meet them, you know? And then at the same time, I leave them all together because both the silk screens, even though let's say that, you know, they're not coming from an original Albers. I was talking to um, someone who works at the Joseph and Nanny Albers estate before meeting you about um, painting the Albers. And I was like, well, which paintings are these fakes? And, in Baragon's faking. And she's like, they're not, there's no referent, you know? And that's so beautiful, this like non-referent, you know? Um, I'm saying too many different things at once. I'm like going off on different tangents and stuff, but 
Um, but this thing of authorship, you know, of stepping into the process and kind of trying to share something impossibly, of course, but to share it in my own experience and kind of try to channel something there. And then the silk screens kind of left Albers in this other way. They weren't as intertwined with him. They were, they were kind of like he's behind me somewhere, you know, out back in the shadow with Barragon because they're something else is happening, something else is taking over in the silk screens and the Albers sort of become this ground, you know, on which time and all these systems of reproduction are happening over. And the funny thing is I asked Mathilde to put a detail in of the surfaces because I kind of feel like Anne had some hand in those um, in those silk screens too, because they look woven, you yes. know. And what that is is we were explained um, from some graphic designers. Dancing foxes came and was looking at them. The two women who run that, and they were explaining that it's called flowering, and that since these were scans of the photographs of the room with the albers in them, and then blown up, is that you're seeing the artifacts of the of the CMYK printing in the book. Right. And so these other layers, it's it adds a different surface quality that that's like weaving. So it has nothing to do with Annie, but I felt like she was jumping in there for a cameo somehow. I, I like it. You know, he had a very interesting attitude toward the printmaking process also. And from a material point of view and a financial point of view, he did something which not everyone approved of. He uh, allowed his printer to sell unsigned overruns, mm. uh, the, the proofs. And of course, commercially, it's much better only to sell signed and numbered prints. And either it's from the edition or it's from the hors de commerce group. Um, but you know that there are only so many of them. But Joseph had the attitude that his, the point of his art was to bring joy to people, uh, not for people to make money. And he was delighted when art students, whoever it was, bought prints. They were $10 each. They were beautifully made. They were made just the way that the signed and numbered prints were made. And I, was sent by him to visit some people who had written about his art as being sonic. They felt that his work could be heard. And this interested him enormously. And I went to their house in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I came back and I said, Mr. Albers, it's remarkable. They had a quite simple apartment, but every room was painted white and there was only one artwork per room and it was one of your unsigned prints and that's all that they had. And he looked at me and he said, Nick, those are people who really see. That's a real art lover, not someone who buys one of my expensive paintings and puts it right next to, and then he would name one of the artists he didn't like who was very fashionable and very expensive. Um, and it, it irked him when people were more interested in having objects than in the experience of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's part of, right? That's the afterlife you can't control of, of where it goes. Um, but I also think that, yeah, that's, that's the thing about putting a work out in the world is like, you don't know where it goes. You don't know the conditions it's going to um, exist under, but that was something that really inspired me about Barragon. Um, and the ironic thing was that his house is full of fakes. I mean, he has Picasso's and Modigliani's and, um, a bunch of a bunch of works and they 
they weren't pretending ever to be the real thing. A lot of times they were just printed on like magazine paper and he would mount them on cardboard. Um, but they, they pointed him to the thing that he loved. And, um, you know, they say copying is, what's the phrase? Copying is the biggest form of flattery. There's a much more eloquent <laughs> way of saying that. Um, but I think it's really interesting, like the, the reasons someone forges something or remakes something and what their intentions are, because it is quite complicated. There's um, certain forgers that will tell you that it was an act of love. In, in making it, it just depends where, when it's being sold and how it's being yeah. represented, right? So it's, it's when it's about making a buck and usurping the authorship of another in a deceitful way, I think then it's, then it's a whole other game and it's just about money and surface. Yes. Um, and, and that's really different. Um, but, uh, but I like so much what you're saying about his generosity with the unnumbered because you also feel the generosity in the work. I mean, it, it is a kind of work that's, and, and also all the books about teaching about color, like it's clear that he was trying to speak um, and be heard and for color to be understood. I mean, he- so, Jill and Nick, I'm going to jump yeah. in one second because I see, I want to be mindful it's, of time yeah. and of the questions that are coming in from our audience. Yes. Um, so there's, I want to read this question. I'm going to paraphrase it. Uh, this conversation is layered like an onion, which <laughs> it's a nice way to start the question. I love it. So thank you. Um, Jill, considering Albert's advanced color theory as we know it today and Rudolf Arnheim advanced light theory, you speak of technology and appropriation so fluidly within these aspects of color and light. I wonder, since technology infiltrates and transforms our lives, the way we see and feel has changed. Can you speak specifically to how this type of work you're doing is so uniquely positioned to help us understand new spatial relationships with art? And I think this can also bring in where we started. And also the question of, how we install these works at the Abridge Champion under Flavin. Maybe you can speak to it, Mattel. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I think one thing that uh, certainly is interesting and that because of course, given the pandemic, Nick, you've not been able to visit yet the space, but uh, the Abridge Hampton is, a, a space that was um, created and renovated by Dan Flavin to host on the second floor, a permanent installation of his work. And of course, as we know, Flavin, Judd and many of the artists of Diaz collection were highly influenced by um, Albers as well. And I think in the work that Flavin presents upstairs, there's this constant um, relationship of light in this case projected both coming filtered into the windows and then projected onto the architecture back by the fluorescent light, which is something that with Jill, we were considering when installing your work, which in this case, of course, uses a different uh, technology and that layers uh, several technologies into one print. But what you asked at the beginning, Nick, regarding light and time, um, the prints are installed in a surround. So what we, we have a rectangular room, there's just one window open, which we added as a trompe l'oeil effect and uh, which we can see here. And so in a way, Jill, especially considering we installed them in the height of the pandemic. Yes. Uh, one thing we were thinking is how they become also as a timekeeper and the changing time in spite of the highly technological, and this is where I go back to the question of our listener, that these are certainly not reproducing nature, but nevertheless, they present us with a passing of time that is in a way dressed as 
the different times of the day, but it is in fact completely uh, mediated by technology. And even more on, so there's that, but then in the making of the steps in which, you know, the scanning um, of the books, and then um, as you saw in that black and white photo, the, they, they were never like photographed straight on because they were always, the, the albers were kind of slipped into the image. It wasn't the focus of the image. So I always had to bend them back into squares. Um, and then there's the technologies of the book printing, depending on like I did a, um, in, in the Bear Gun Archives project, I did a bunch of these framed books because it was the only way I could frame certain um, or present photographs without infringing on um, Vitra's copyright of Baragon's house was by framing the actual book because it was pre-published. But what um, becomes really interesting is I started framing the same books, but they were different pieces. Let's say it was the same photograph in three different publications, the same photograph reappearing in different books because certain publications, the inks were like on cheaper paper or um, glossy versus matte. And it was like what I was saying about the catalog of the Albers book, that all of those um, technology choices completely changed the work and the feeling of the work in that space. So, um, so the whole question of originality and copy gets really thrown through, through the lens of technology, you know, on, on all these levels. And, um, and there's this, this one book that I, I don't own, but one day I will, it's on like my wish list bucket list, but there's a um, Albers book that he silk screened directly into the book. Do you know which book I'm talking about, Nick? It's this really thick Albers book and it's not in my slides, I don't, but um, they're sure. silk screens um, in a book and they're like, I forget what it's called, but when they glue in um, an image, like tapping it in or I, I I don't remember what it's called, but the book is now like a thousand dollars to buy the book. Um, and Baragon has one in his house. And I was so excited <laughs> when I saw it there. And actually in the film, The Proposal, I, I'm on my tiptoes and I pull a book down and it is that book, so. Was it Interaction of Color? I, I, you know what, I can't remember. I just remember, what, no, I don't think so. Um, it's it's um, but it's this amazing thing where like suddenly the the page just changes that you can feel that it's paint on paper and it's just so um, there's something so remarkable about it because it's like the artwork got inside the book and I'm sure people wanted to rip out the pages and frame them, but they're just so much more special that they're attached to the book and like, you're just not allowed to kind of show them as art because you'd, you'd have to deface the book to show them. He sent Barrick on a book and referred to it in a letter. I will find that letter. Oh, I didn't and find that when I was snooping through your archive. <laughs> no, for sure uh, which book it was. Uh, but he, yes, he, he loved the silk screening process and felt that it was very important to accept ink as ink and not to reproduce paint. Mm. Mathilde, are we still responding yeah. to questions? Oh, I can't hear you. Mathilde? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Are, are we responding to questions still? Hold on. I have a question if I may, Jill. Um, the, the photography aspect really interests me. And my question is, did you 
photograph each piece as it's as it hang in situ in Casa Baragon, or were you able to move them around and play around with the lighting and things like that? Well, I didn't photograph them. Oh, so right. all of the all of the pieces in Dia are photographs that existed and were published in books, usually on Baragon's work. Um, once in a while, it was um, in a book that had more architects or there was a different theme. But so um, the photographs, yeah, were default. They were given. Um, and so I would find the photographs in the book and select them. But one thing I think is really interesting in this investigation of authorship is the photographer in a lot of the law, like for instance, with in the Barragon archives, how you can't reproduce um, a photograph of, of Barragon's house because his house is owned, the rights to the images is owned by um, the foundation. It totally eclipses the authorship of the photographer. So it flattens it. It says that what is in the image is owned so you can't take a photograph, but we all know the power of photography that, that through one camera versus another, the entire situation changes. And so I thought, I think that's this really interesting thing where, um, where sometimes authorship is just completely overlooked um, and, and the photographer has no, has, has, has no like legal space there. That is interesting. Very interesting. So I realize that we are five minutes already beyond our time together. So I think I'm going to thank you all and all our, of our listeners as well. And this is to be picked up again next time. And Matilda, if I may, Looking at Jill and thinking about what you both do, I would like to quote Joseph, who said, to distribute material possessions is to divide them. To distribute spiritual possessions is to multiply them. And that's what you do. Thank you, Nick. I hope so. Thank you, Nick. That, thank you so much, Nick and Josh and Mathilde. What a great way to spend 12 to one on a Tuesday. So, <laughs> and thank you everyone who, who um, is listening and, um, and to Dia and the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, bye.